Hello YouTube, this is Michael Solomon with Dream Life Lucid where we learn to master lucid dreaming so we can live our dream lives. Today's video is about talking to the dead via dreams or lucid dreaming. If you guys have had lost loved ones that have passed on, people that were close to you that you loved and valued in your life and now there's a void in your life, there's a way that you can talk to your loved ones via lucid dreaming and that's what this video is about today. I'm just asking you guys to suspend any beliefs that you may have about the afterlife or the hereafter and just, you know, just be open to the information. These beliefs that we have and we hold and we carry around and we believe that are our own beliefs are planted in us. You know, just on a day to day basis, being bombarded with the same information that everybody carries around. And this is kind of like the zeitgeist that people live in. So we carry these limiting beliefs into the dream world which actually limits us from being able to do things in an environment where we can do anything like whatever you think of you can do there's also this belief that all we see is all that there is so even for example with the scientific process and i'm not knocking science because i consider myself a true scientist but there was this book that i read called the secret history of dreaming by robert moss that kind of blew my mind in Kemet or ancient egypt these certain priests during this festival after the pharaoh was ruling for 30 years basically in order to prove that he was actually pharaoh worthy and this is like early dynastic times too so in order to prove that this pharaoh was truly pharaoh worthy they called him the lord of two worlds the one world would be the actual physical realm and then the other world would be the astral realm. So one, the Pharaoh was told to descend into the underworld. Then he was literally directed to enter death and touch the four sides of the land. And we're talking the astral land, basically. Become Osiris, who is the God who dies and who is reborn and then returns in new garment. Even the, the scene in the Black Panther, if you guys saw the Black Panther movie where T'Challa had to drink this stuff and got buried in this ashes of his ancestors. And then when he woke up, he was talking to his father and his father gave him some advice. See, lucid dreaming was literally called dream yoga prior. There were like whole secret schools on this as far as writing your dreams down and getting into the discipline of actually remembering, remembering your dreams and becoming a lord of both worlds. Okay, so you can talk to dead people in your dreams. I had a friend, Anthony Moore, Anthony was like a, a handsome, charismatic, very uh, optimistic young man. And I have found out that Anthony Moore had committed suicide, um, suicide. And I just didn't believe it. You know, I, I had found out three months after Anthony died. So it was just like a shock to me. It was a shock that he was dead and then a shock that I had missed the whole thing. So it was that void and all these other feelings and emotions and stuff. I talked to his cousin. And his cousin told me that he committed suicide. I'm like, how'd he do it? He said, well, he shot himself. But the coroner said that the bullet went down on his head. And I know this might be a little graphic for some people or whatever, but this is a real life story where the bullet went down on his head and nobody's gonna hold a gun up to their head and shoot themselves like that. It's just like almost unnatural. If you're about to blow yourself away, you're just about to do it. So that was my indication that maybe somebody else had did it. And, um, we found out that his wife was there and everything. And I know that they had little riffs and beefs and everything. And if anybody was going to do it, she'd be the one to do it. So this is what I was running around thinking in my head. Like, I know she killed my friend, this and that. And one day while I was at the Playhouse Square, after the show let out, we were all just standing there. And this one lady stood in front of me and said, you know, good job. And this and that. My stomach starts churning, butterflies in the stomach, crazy. And it was Anthony's wife. So... This is one of those rare times I actually bit my tongue. I said nothing to her. I didn't say anything that I was thinking. And I just, you know, I just basically let her go. Okay, but I'm thinking the whole time you killed my friend. So she goes off, enjoys her night or whatever. And that night I had a dream about Anthony in the playhouse, but he was behind the ticket booth, like behind his glass. And I looked, I said, man, that is Anthony Moore. Looked exactly like him, dressed like him, everything. So I walked up to the glass and I said, with the expectation of, you know, me having this dream and being able to control everything, 
I said, if your wife killed you, shake your head yes. If she didn't, just shake your head no. You don't have to say anything. He walks up to the glass, puts his hand on the glass. I put my hand on the glass with him and, and like touch his hand. And he looks me dead in the eye and says, I was on some bullshit that night. And then he starts crying. I start crying in the dream and I wake up with tears coming down my face. Only one or two times that I can remember actually crying out of my sleep. Month, month and a half later, I bump into his cousin, my friend Donnie. And he tells me that that night, Anthony was wilding out, was uh, under the influence of certain drugs and this and that. And whatever occurred that night, whether it was his wife or not, Anthony told me himself that he was on some BS that night. Come to find out he was shooting in the streets and everything, just wild. Not to put my, my friend out there because I love Anthony, but this is just a real story and that's really how it happened. And I found out later he was on some bullshit that night, but he actually told me that. So that was one example. Another example was recently back in May, 2019, my grandfather passed. Now my grandfather was like my father. My grandfather dies in May. Um, I missed the flight to go to his funeral, which is one of the noblest men I ever met to pay my respects. I missed the flight from California back to Cleveland. And I was just so depressed about it. I just felt like, you know, I let him down. You know, how could I allow myself to miss the flight? So my grandfather came to me in my dream and uh, forget the scenery. He just basically walked in the door, looked at me and said, Michael, I see what you're doing. You're on the right path. Keep keep doing exactly what you're doing. The only thing you need to do is learn how to save some of that money, all right? And he winks at me. And we were never like, we never had a winking culture. My grandfather winked at me in this dream and he left. I wake up, wrote it down. And about a month later, I was looking over my Instagram and I saw a post that I had put up about my grandfather where I told him that I was gonna keep my promise to him. That's between him and I. And I had a winking emoji at the bottom of the message that I sent him or the, the post that I put up about him. So when he winked at me in my dream and then I realized about a month later that I had already winked at him, it just blew my mind. What I wanted to tell you guys was lucid dreaming. It's called dream yoga and it was actually an exercise to speak to your ancestors because that's the plane that you go on. The astral realm and the afterlife realm are very similar. So dreaming or lucid dreaming was actually used as a practice for the afterlife so you know how to maneuver when your body dies and then this is what i, I could get into like i guess the, those western views is what i was talking about like the scientific approach of all of this would be to observe phenomenon and form a hypothesis test it until you prove it right or wrong you have to understand that we as human beings are limited to the ultraviolet spectrum on the whole electromagnetic spectrum. So knowing that we are missing out on about 90% of reality via these eyeballs, can you truly have a true scientific process knowing you're blinded to 90% of what's really going on around us? And that correlates to us using 10% of our brain. Me personally, I, I think it's lower than that, but. They say we use 10% of our brain. That means 90% of it is dormant. Just like when it comes to the ultraviolet spectrum and the electromagnetic spectrum, we are limited. We're limited to what we can see, what we can perceive and what we can understand. So how can you base science off of observation when that's only 10% of the whole reality? It makes no sense. But um, I'll tell you a story. I, my friend of some years ago had a guy that wanted her to be the spokesperson for this this new invention which was like front brake lights back at the time this was like 2005 she wanted me to drive to his house with him because he invited her out there alone she was a little scared of him or whatever so i drove and the guy's name was michael allen he stayed out in bath county and again this was early 2005 this was lebron james was building his house right next door to michael allen who was uh, worked for this invention company so He's giving us a tour of this house and he's taking us, you know, all throughout rooms and they got speakers in every room and canopy beds with the tree trunks coming out the corner. It was just a dope house. And he takes me into this one room where he had like this shrine, basically, of his great great grandmother with feathers and flowers and candles and shit. And I'm like, man, he's into that hoodoo voodoo. 
And uh, he was just basically telling, because we had a long, we were having a conversation about metaphysics the whole time. And he tells me, you know, you got to talk to your ancestors. You know, it's mandatory you talk to your ancestors. And I just really wasn't feeling that because that's not how I came up. I didn't, didn't understand it. I didn't hear anything that he was saying. So years later, there was a study done about epigenetics where um, lab mice or lab rats were sprayed with the cherry blossom scent. You guys can check all this stuff out. I might have a link, might not. I might not even feel like doing all that. Anything I'm saying, you can Google. So there was a study done about the cherry blossom scent being sprayed on these mice and they were being electrocuted as they were smelling the cherry blossom scent. So they would be apprehensive of the cherry blossom scent every time they smelled it because they knew this the shock was coming. Do you know that 14 generations down, the mice were still scared of the cherry blossom scent and had never even smelled it? So you have to understand what's happening to us as humans as far as this conditioning and the social engineering and layers and layers and layers upon lies and lies and what we're supposed to perceive or how we're supposed to perceive is literally being steered. And I, I bought that genetic information up because... My grandfather used to tell me, you're going to remember more than you learn, which never really made sense to me. But at 17, I had bought my first vehicle. I was working at this job called Jeepers, which was like a indoor amusement park for kids. Like it was kind of like a Chuck E. Cheese on steroids. It had like an indoor roller coaster in the mall and stuff. And I was just a game technician there. So I would I would just fix all the games and everything. But I figured out that the ski ball machine, because we used to count the tokens at the end of the night, every night, found out the ski ball machine, we don't really count until maybe a week or every other week or something. So this is an admission of guilt right here. Is this, I used to steal at 17 years old, working a job, taking tokens out of the ski ball machine. And when I see mothers putting $20 bills into the machine, I'll run up to him and say, hey, about to put that old 20 into the machine? Um, I'll give you $30 of tokens for that $20. And that's how I bought my first car. So I bought this $450 car from this guy, I can't remember his name. It was a push button start. And I'm not talking about the futuristic kind. I'm talking about wires hanging out with this little red button and I had to push it to start it up. Bought my first car, hit it from my grandfather. It was around the corner from where we used to live at. And this was winter time. So in Cleveland, Ohio, you know, we see the seasons drastically. It could be 101. 103 in the summer and negative 18 in the winter. So we see the seasons literally cut and dry. So it's snowy as shit out there. Um, there's this curb around up going up 90 east that they used to call Dead Man's Curve in Cleveland. The, the lake used to spill up on it. It was all type of slush. And you'll see hundreds of skid marks on this wall just from all the people that slipped, bumped, and kept going. It's called Dead Man's Curve. So I'm just speeding. I'm, I'm being it. Ignorant, 17 years old, I'm, do, I'm doing about I'm doing about 65 on the freeway. And I hit this patch of slush, snow, and ice. And the car spins in a complete 180. But while it's spinning, I let go of the wheel, let go of the gas. The wheel's jumping this way. And by the time it went to the front, I by the time the car faced back forward, I snatched the wheel and punched the gas and shot through and went straight. Nobody taught me how to do that. That was my first time driving under icy conditions. That's one of the first times driving on the freeway for real that I had slipped and saved my life with the maneuver that maybe an expert driver would have. But see, I didn't learn how to do that. But somebody before me knew how to do that, whether it was a vehicle or something similar, whatever the case may be, I knew how to do it. I drummed it up and pulled it out of me to save my life at the time. Some people, oh, that's your intuition. But my intuition is just like insight and inspiration. It's all in you. So these are the genetic memories that I was pulling up to save my life. And I just brought that up to um, kind of let you know that your ancestors are with you. And it was my own ignorance that had me rejecting that whole theory until I got the scientific side of it and put the two together. Like, oh, my God, what they're talking about with ancestry just matches up with epigenetics because we are not individuals, we are not alone, we are a collection of generations behind us both ways. And um, you guys can truly talk to the dead. That's what this is used for. The dead are not dead. They're just not in physical bodies anymore. And just because we can't see past this 3D physical reality 
does not mean nothing else is going on. So just because you don't know something's going on doesn't mean it's not happening. And the majority of the world does not know what's going on. So I urge you guys to look into this. If you have lost ones that have passed on, dream of them, talk to them, ask them questions, and you'll get information from them that you could have only received from them. Dream Life Lucid, I love you guys. If there's anything I forgot, leave a comment. Sweet Lucid Dream.